chair. Okay. Sorry, it's always a little tricky with Zoom. Let me put it in present mode. Okay, so first I just wanted to introduce our team. This is a snippet of our team that we were able to get together a few months ago, and it was really nice to see everybody. Um, unfortunately, not everybody could make it, but just to really see people in person was really fantastic. Um, today on our call, we will be having uh, three of us. So it's, uh, my name is Kirby. I'm the owner of Insight. I'm one of the founders and also the head of college counseling. I have two of our other counselors with us, Maylin and Priya are gonna be here to answer all of your questions. Um, and I'll be moderating questions for them. So you're really gonna be able to benefit from the expertise that they have. Insight is celebrating almost our 23 years of being in business. So we've been working in, with high school students and their families for a really long time and have seen so many changes happen. Um, we've worked with thousands of kids at this point. We've read so many applications, so many essays. And really for us, the joy is helping kids realize their goals and going through this process. We just did a count, now that we're in senior season, application season, we just did a count on Friday that as of right now, end of September, we've already reviewed more than 200 applications. And since we try to review applications multiple times, we've had about 400 pairs of eyes on applications so far. And we know we have many, many more to go, but we're really excited about where our seniors are in their process. Um, so with that, I just wanna talk about a little bit about who we are. We, our goal and our motto is apply to college, prepare for life. So our goal is not just thinking about college and thinking about a specific college. Our goal is really helping kids to find their path through high school, which is gonna really help them while they are in college and again throughout their lives. So it's really about building the right set of skills, pursuing the right opportunities, really talking, talking with them. It's a very, our service is a very personalized service. We really get to know our kids well. And I mean, well, like to the point that they stay in touch with us well after their college admissions process, well after they graduate from high school, many kids will come back to us after graduate school counseling. Um, you know, I've been to weddings of some of my students. I get baby pictures from some of my kids that are now having their own kids, so they're not kids anymore. So really getting to cultivate these deep relationships with them. And by doing so, we're able to help them find their individual path. Um, so it's really, it's a really rewarding career that we are in. Challenging at points, of course. Um, so I just want to talk about the four bits of the college admissions process. And three of these are pretty obvious. And we're going to dive into them more deeply and really talk about test scores and what does that mean, what's test optional, etc. But the first is the academics. And I will just say academic profile, GPA, course selection, those are the most important things. We say that they are king in the admissions process. And there is very little that matters more than academic profile. And when I say very little, I mean almost nothing. And in only very specific cases can something matter more than academic profile. So really helping kids to find the right courses, the right balance, um, helping them explore extracurriculars, looking for opportunities outside of school to really pursue academic interests is something that's very important to us. Test scores is something that has been around for a long time. Obviously, a lot of changes are happening right now in terms of the need for test scores. Um, and so we're going to go through that more deeply, but still a relatively important part of the process for the schools that still look at them. The next piece is activities, interests, and major. And these are three big things tied into this one little category. So activities are really an opportunity for students to engage in things outside of the classroom, explore their interests, really think about what they might like to do, uh, develop a different set of skills. And it's really an opportunity to, what we wrote here, self-discovery, but really important. Your children are young, right? So I don't even know what grade your children are in, but I can assume that they range anywhere from middle school to now being potentially a senior in high school. They're still young. Um, so even if you have a senior in high school, if they are still trying to figure out what they wanna do with their life, that is okay. That is what this part of this time of their life is about. Um, but really, you know, helping them think about opportunities and career paths that they could consider, that's the goal. Forcing them into one career path is not necessarily the goal, but helping them to explore is really important. And then there's this thing called non-cognitive factors. And non-cognitive factors is a term that we've been saying, talking about for like the last decade or so in our office. 
But these are important skills that colleges are really starting to place quite a bit of emphasis on. And these are those things that are harder to measure. Uh, the more intangibles, really thinking about uh, ability to overcome adversity, interest in inter intercultural exchange, and ability to be creative. And so these are skills that colleges are saying, we really want to start measuring these more deeply. And how do we actually do that? College essays are really obviously one big part of it, but there are multiple other components that can show these different sides. Why are these important? Well, many kids have great grades. Many kids have great test scores. Many kids have an interesting set of extracurriculars, but these non-cognitive factors can actually be a huge, huge part of an application that sets them apart. Um, so just you know, very briefly about our services, we offer one-on-one -on -one counseling. It's really the core of our business. Through the one-on-one -on -one counseling, we talk about academic planning and extracurriculars, and we're thinking about the non-cognitives, we're thinking about the, apply to, the skills that they can apply to the rest of their lives, so really broadly covering so many different things. We do also offer test prep and tutoring, and this could be for um, standardized testing or it could be for academic courses. And then, of course, we go through the college admissions process, which we're deep in right now with our class of 2022. Um, I want to really briefly talk about some trends. So last year, obviously, well, 2020 and 2021 really set some new trends that were happening because of the pandemic. Some are trends that were already in the making and that just got accelerated because of the pandemic, and some were definitely new trends. And we think that data is really important for you guys to have a sense of what's out there, but we also want to be careful placing too much emphasis on data. Um, so here we just have some admissions applications, information about the UCs. We know that UCs tend to be very popular for our kids in the Bay Area. And so just really seeing that the application numbers are skyrocketing. Now, what happened here for the UCs last year between 2020 and 2021 was obviously the dismissal of test scores. So UCs, if, if you're not aware, they no longer look at SAT or ACT. They will not even accept them. It's not test optional. They do not accept them. They are forming a new test. Um, they're, they're in the very early stages of that. And that is something that might launch for the class of 2025. So for families that are in 2022, 23, 24, um, it's not something that you will have to worry about. But what happened there was application skyrocketed. And so because kids who said before, I might not be able to get into a UC or a specific UC with my test scores are now saying, oh, that's not really a barrier any longer. So, you know, UCLA, for example, had almost 140,000 application, applications. The difference was nearly 30,000 apps. To give you a sense of what that means, the incoming class size at UCLA is 6,000. They could have filled the class five times over just with a difference in the number of applications. And it is now below a 10 percent or right at a 10 percent acceptance rate, which is a staggering, staggering rate. It's an exceptional school, but a very staggering rate in terms of UC admissions. We also saw across the board, you know, applications rising. Um, one thing I'd like to point out, which is always a little bit surprising to people, is that, you know, often people in the Bay Area believe that Berkeley is the most popular UC. It's actually not. It's, it's actually moved up. Um, you know, a few years ago, as you can see the number here, it was literally the fifth most popular UC, and now it's going up, and now it's like the third most popular, and not to say it's easy to get into, um, but it's just, it's, you know, people have a misperception of what Berkeley means relative to the other UCs. So really just we're seeing number of applications going up. Just going back this for a second, do we anticipate this will continue? Yes. We anticipate that the numbers will continue to climb for this year as um, more families choose to apply, maybe potentially want to stay in California, and of course the, the missing test scores. Um, here we've seen some other trends for other schools. So again, just a comparison between 2016, 2022, and 2021 apps. And the big difference here is that 2020 to 2021 jump, because that was the, the beginning of the pandemic to the heart of the pandemic. And a better indicator of where we are right now is 2021 and setting the right trends. Again, just across the board, we're seeing applications generally on the rise. And now we're seeing admissions results um, generally on the decline as well. I don't think any of this information really is surprising. I know people like to see data, so we're presenting it here. We're really just you know, emphasizing that, yeah, schools are getting more competitive, but are they getting more competitive because more people are applying or is there something else happening? And for the most part, it's really that more people are applying. 
as well, that meaning that more people are applying to more schools. And it ends up being a, a cycle, right? So people worry about, oh my gosh, schools are so hard to get into. I'm going to apply to more schools. So they apply to more schools, admissions numbers go down. So then the next year around, people feel even more panicked. I'm going to apply to more schools. And so there's this trend that's happening where there's a panic of needing to apply to too many schools. We work really hard with our families and we always tell them to do the hard work now of selecting your college list, a balanced college list, so that you're not applying to a ridiculous number of schools. We don't advocate for that. It usually means that kids are so stressed out, sending out too many applications that may not be of the highest quality, actually, right? Like why send in a mediocre application to many schools when you can send excellent applications to fewer schools and really maximize your chances of getting in? So just a little bit here about test optional, because this is something that people are talking about so much, is that many schools have extended their test optional policies. If your child is in class of 2022 or 2023, we anticipate that these policies will stay very similar. But, you know, we are noticing that some schools are saying, okay, guys, it's enough. We need ha to have testing back. Um, so Georgia Tech, um, University of Georgia, also Georgetown. So a lot of the Georgia schools um, have said we want testing back. It's been too long. So even for this year, they're requiring testing. Yale, last year, the admissions office, director of admissions says we really missed testing. So while Yale is still test optional, there is an implication there that they really do value test scores as part of the admissions process. So for students that are younger, you know, we are still advocating that they should think about testing because we just don't know what how the pendulum is going to swing over the next couple of years. In the same boat, like there are some schools that have gone test blind. Caltech has now said we are going to be test blind, which is very shocking for a lot of families that are thinking Caltech is such a STEM heavy school, it's so numbers oriented, why wouldn't they want testing? But they have moved to test blind for this year. So, you know, in both directions, we're seeing some changes happening. And I want to show you just a little bit of data here. So this is for 2021. And, you know, just take a second to digest this. When we look at schools that are in the most selective category, which are schools that have a less than 24 acceptance rate, for the schools that allowed testing, so not test blind schools, but were test optional schools, what did we see? Well, we noticed that, you know, number of, the percentage of apps going in with testing with the very selective schools was more than 50%. And part of this was that some kids had their testing done. Their testing didn't get affected. And so they were able to turn their testing in. California was the state that had the most number of tests canceled during the pandemic. It's still happening. Um, kids have already told me their October SAT has been canceled. Their September ACT got canceled, things like that. But California got hard, hit the hardest. Um, but, you know, in the admissions process, we saw that the most loved of schools, kids were still submitting their tests. And the admissions rate, when you look at it, these are still very low admissions rates. But we're noticing that kids who did submit testing, you know, had a higher acceptance rate. Does that mean you have to submit every test score? Absolutely not. One of my students that got into Stanford last year, she sent in no testing. Um, and my other students that did get in all had submitted testing. So it really does vary. But, and this is an individual conversation that we're having with students depending on their college list, as well as, you know, what their test scores are and will their test scores support their application or could it potentially hurt their application. So I know a lot of questions are going to come up around testing. We're happy to answer as many of them as we, as we can. Um, another thing is about major. So we often see um, a lot of pressure on majors for our students, um, particularly in Bay Area, but definitely across all of our applicants. A couple of stats here. So for UCI, they came out with this number that, you know, the majority of their applicants, I want to say it was something like also 80% of students apply to just six majors. 80% of students apply to just six majors. Biology was their most popular. So now we get high numbers of applications going to the same major. The school has to say, well, we cannot accept all of these students, not because we don't think these kids are great, but rather we are not gonna be able to provide the resources to all of the students that want to pursue this particular major. And so that definitely can have an impact on the admissions process. Does that mean you should choose a random major and apply? Absolutely not, because you wanna make sure that your child can study what they actually would like to study. Um, and some schools, they, they're not able to change their major. So this idea of gaming the system is not possible, but also really encouraging our students to be broad in what they're thinking about. Their academic interests is really important. 
Uh, Berkeley's overall acceptance rate is between, you know, around 13 and 14 percent, but EECS, which is their, in, in the engineering program, the electrical engineering computer science, is around 6 percent. Um, another stat that, you know, we just got the details from last night, Milan um, sent it out, is that for University of Washington, students applying from out of state to University of Washington for comp sci, the acceptance rate is 3 percent for computer science out of state. And so um, those are the kinds of numbers that we're looking at for some of these really popular majors. And you know, here's below a list of what we're seeing as impacted majors. So um, just a little bit of advice before we jump in and have our conversation. We do expect numbers to remain elevated and, and to continue to rise at least for the next two years. We definitely want uh, families and students to keep their options open um, and accordingly you know, evaluate testing as a, a good plan for you. If you're already a senior, you hopefully already have this plan in place. If you're a younger student, you know, now is the time, depending if you're a sophomore, junior, this is the time to really start thinking about it. If you're a freshman, you have a little bit of time. And if you're younger, you definitely have time to think about it. But really, you know, don't assume test optional means you shouldn't take testing. It could still be valuable for you. Looking at broad set of majors are really important. And one of our most popular clinics that we do is actually called Alternative Majors to Computer Science. Um, and it's literally uh, so highly sought after that clinic, but it's really because people are wanting to find out what are opportunities to look at computer science beyond just computer science. I'm really encouraging you, if you have not already yet, to build a balanced, um, ambitious, yet realistic list. And what does that mean? It means so many different things. It means that, you know, we want to be really thoughtful about building out a list and making sure it's not too big, making sure there are schools at what we call the dream schools as well as schools that are in the target range. The, our goal is that kids are getting into schools that are a good fit for them where they're gonna thrive. That's the key, right? We wanna make sure that we're setting them up for success. Getting into college is not the end goal. It is not the goal of your parenting. Your parenting is to raise kids that are gonna be successful in life. And so it's helping them to do that. And the list is part of that. So we're just gonna jump over and start talking to Priya and Maylin. Um, and, you know, before we do that, there is a special offer. We're offering an SAT class coming up um, in the fall. And so we have a special, some special codes here. So feel free to jot these down if you're interested in it. You can also just email us directly and we can um, send you the offers that we have. So I'm going to jump over. I do see a couple of questions coming in. I, I want to get started with a few questions for our panelists, and then we'll jump into questions that you guys might have. So Maylin, my first question is for you. First, welcome Maylin and Priya. I hope that we can, everyone can see you. Hi, everybody. Um, so my question first, Maylin, this is for you. Are things as bad as the numbers imply? Should students be worried about getting into college? I, I think it's totally natural to worry. I, I can, you, even if I said, hey, don't worry, that's probably not gonna stop you from worrying. It's probably best to just, so, I always tell families, just make your plan, right? You're gonna make a reasonable plan and then you can adjust along the way. So yes, you can you can put a lot of energy into worrying, but it's best to make a plan and continue to move forward with a plan. So yes, it, I mean, the numbers are very clear. It's uh, um, the competition continues to be um, very brisk. But that it just means um, you can get even more excited about how you plan your time in high school. Yeah. Um, Priya, I want to ask you the same question. How would you answer that? Like families are definitely panicking. We see it every day. What's the advice that you give to a family when they come in really stressed out about the admissions process? I think I would definitely tell them to be very realistic. Be very realistic about the um, academic skills that your student has. Also be very realistic about the college list that you're preparing, because I know all of us want our students or our children to go to like really fancy schools. And that that feeling, I think, just more in the barrier than anywhere else I've seen. Uh, but that being said, you have to kind of also understand that your student perhaps wants to not study CS or perhaps does not want to go to an IV. So I think having a very frank conversation with your children and understanding what the capabilities are in in real time would really be helpful in selecting the right college and the right major. And I think that would um, kind of definitely ease up on the worry for sure. Yeah, let's actually talk about major a little bit. Um, and and Priya, I'll, I'll, I'll toss this question to you directly. What trends are you seeing in terms of majors? You talked about CS a little bit. What else are you seeing? That and what else? 
Um, so what <coughs> I see with the students that I work with primarily is there is definitely an interest now in political science or law. I see a lot of youngsters wanting to get into that whole genre of work, uh, wanting to change the world, wanting to kind of make a difference. That's one that's coming up. Psychology, um, neuroscience, cognitive science is coming up a lot as well. The other thing that's happening is students now kind of understand that plain computer science is, is a great option, but they also have some other wonderful options associated with that. So perhaps data science or applied physics or applied math you know, combined with data science and statistics and economics. So the, the beauty of it now is that colleges also understand that having just one specific major perhaps doesn't work for the student and for them too, because, you know, these are impacted majors. So they are creating these um, segues into different uh, majors, which are really allowing the students to pick electives, which then they can make into a minor or come away with a very interesting degree at the end of their four years. Mm -hmm. I'm just gonna move this over to this. Um, and Maylin, how about you? Any other trends that you're seeing? Yeah, definitely. Um, just to over, just to echo some of what Priya was saying, um, definitely an interest in data science and uh, offshoots of CS, but also uh, there's a huge sophistication among parents and even students among majors. And so they're very mindful of that when putting together their college lists. Yeah, and also that in, you know, the, the the trends that we often hear about include comp sci, pre-med, which pre-med is coming back in with a big force. Like at some point it was like a decade ago, it was like I could I could pick out which kids were gonna tell me they want to do pre-med and which were gonna do comp sci. And then we saw a big shift towards comp sci, a lot of girls also moving towards comp sci. Um, and now one thing I will say, like, you know, people often feel like, oh, if you're a girl that wants to do comp sci or engineering, it's a it's a benefit. Not anymore in the Bay Area. There's an equal number of kids that are applying, girls and boys that are applying comp sci engineering um, from the Bay Area. So I wouldn't say it's as much of an advantage any longer. Definitely, if they want to pursue that those paths, they absolutely should. Um, business is definitely very popular. Entrepreneurship, as especially um, within business, we're seeing quite a bit of. Um, psychology, people often think it's surprising, but like, just like Priya said, psychology is exceptionally popular, one of the most impacted programs in the country. And Cox, I feel like is now coming up as an offshoot of computer science and kind of that blend between psychology and computer science, right? Definitely for kids that are interested in artificial intelligence, machine learning, Cox, I tends to be very popular for them as well. So, you know, some other trends that we are, we're definitely noticing. Can I ask you, when you have a student that comes in that says, I'm really set on, um, pre I'll, I'll ask you first, I'm really set on pre-med or, and I wanna go to med school that long-term, or I wanna go to computer science. What are the things that you look for in that student? Well, definitely, for, let's just take it by, you know, first by computer science. If the student is telling me that he or she is interested in pursuing a major in computer science, I will definitely look for one, of course, the you know, the grades, the interest in um, math and the sciences. And then if they have taken any summer classes or done any activities, which kind of reflect that for me on the, either the transcript or their extracurricular activities or projects or internship that could also kind of supplement their application when they apply, you know, for computer science. Just kind of going in just with a transcript at this stage, particularly doesn't seem to kind of make it happen because there's really so much competition for computer science that we encourage students to do anything and everything they can outside of school as well. And, and the same being said for pre-med, there essentially is no major as pre-med, it's just a lot of science classes which are targeted towards training you to do the MCAT later on after you graduated after four years in, in college. And again, the same thing. Um, so currently I'm coaching somebody who is applying as a pre-med student and, um, and their background has been littered with, you know, working in a hospital um, as a volunteer and then working with a doctor writing a research paper. Um, so activities which reflect a passion and which actually then follow the passion all the way through from maybe ninth or 10th grade so that we can show that this is a continued interest for the student. Mm -hmm. um, and Nilan, what about, what do you look for when you see kids that wanna do computer science or engineering? So definitely um, in their activities, 
I usually see a thread in which they love to make things. So whether that is, that might mean woodworking, maybe when they're in junior high and maybe later it means, oh, you know, I taught myself Python and so on, but having direct hands-on experiences in which they're making things, being creative um, and like Priya was saying, taking classes um, to expand their knowledge base, definitely that's something we look for. And also it's very available in this area. So if you wanna study CS, you could throw a mouse and hit something that probably will help you do that in, in Silicon Valley. What about for kids that don't know what they wanna do, right? So I think there's a lot of pressure where kids feel like all my friends, they know what they want to do. They've known since they were in diapers that they were going to go down this particular path. I don't know. I'm feeling really lost and they're feeling a lot of pressure. What advice, I'll ask you, Malin, what advice do they, do you get to those kids? Because there's, it's a good number and, you know, it's, it's hard to be in that boat in this area. It's, so this is completely normal outside of the Bay Area. Maybe here people can't say that out loud, but it definitely happens. And one thing I really encourage students to do is informational interviewing. Like they might kind of know what their parents or the parents' friends do, but they don't really know what that means. Like, oh, so for example, one of my students, um, I had asked her, hey, would you consider doing informational interviewing for some of the people in your life? She's like, oh, okay. So the easiest people to ask are the parents, but then one of her, and they're engineers. Um, and she's not interested in that, but she also asked uh, a parent, a friend of the family who's, who does uh, human resources, well, that person started out in psychology. She's like, oh, okay. I thought studying psychology means you have to end up being a psychologist and then you're talking to people on the couch. And so that sort of, right, is sort of opened her mind. So having contact with people, um, it's great to look up information on the internet, but I actually tell students, the best way is just engage with actual people because the, the information comes alive for you. And that, um, that plus getting hands-on experiences, right? If you have an inspiring conversation with someone, maybe that'll lead you to doing something hands-on, right? So always, always, um, I encourage students, get some experience. You might not like it, that's fine. Then you're gonna go explore something else. Yeah. And, you know, just to give us that out there, 95% of students change their major at least one time in college and colleges are very happy with that they're excited they're like listen this is what why we exist we are here to expose you to give you the academic skill set to give you the professional skill set to be able to pursue different pathways but we want you to come and explore here and so you know i had a student who one year you know she's she, well not for one year for four years she's like i'm going to become a doctor and i was like you're not She's like, I am. I was like, you're not. And I had a rapport with her where I could say that to her. She's like, I am. I'm like, you're not. She went to college. Her first quarter, she changed to math. She's like, I think I want to go to business. I'm like, now we're talking. Like, that is exactly who you are. Um, and then she eventually ended up going to business school and works in private equity right now. Like, it was definitely the right path for her. But it was she just had no idea. Another student, you know, who's in med school right now, she you know, knew she wanted to go into medicine, didn't know which path. She thought it was bio. When she got to college, she took a really cool course in medical anthropology and loved it so much. She majored in it and had no idea what medical anthropology was before she got to college. Most people would have zero idea um, and took this really unique path and did all the pre-med courses she was required to take and got into literally one of the top uh, med schools in the country. And, you know, there's a question here that's related, which is, do we need to apply to a specific major? It really depends on the university. So some schools like the UCs, you generally indicate your interest in a major. You can definitely put undeclared, but if you're interested in an impacted major, you should put that on your application first because your student or your child may not be able to get into that major down the road. Other universities, generally private universities um, and generally smaller schools will tell you, we don't really care what you want to major in, tell us what your interests are um, and come to our school, explore. They have shopping periods in the first few weeks of school, like they can try out a bunch of different classes. And so it's really, um, it's really open and very flexible. So it really does vary on a school by school basis. Um, and it does depend on the major. Generally, I would say kids are applying to a blend of public and private schools. So some schools will have to pick a major and some schools are gonna have flexibility. I had a student who one year, she put 
bio, music, and Spanish, and authentically wanted to pursue every single one of those. She was a world-class musician. Um, she went to med school. She's fluent in Spanish, and she still plays um, professionally for her, her instrument. So those three majors totally made sense for her. Those interests made sense for her. And so, and a college didn't say, oh, you're so distracted. You're all over the place. You don't know what you want to do. We're not going to admit you. Um, so it's okay. And I always just say to your children that are, you know, so, so young, it's fine if you don't know what you want to do in your life. High school is, again, high school and college are really good times to explore. We don't want you to feel like you never want to know, but really thinking about, oh, I think I'm interested in this. We'll go pursue some opportunities, like Malin was saying. I'm thinking about this now. Okay, now go pursue those opportunities. And some kids worry about, I'm like, this summer I did this and this summer I did this and they're different. I'm like, but did you learn from each of those opportunities? And they'll say, yeah. I'm like, well, then that's a great part of your story. As long as you learn from each of those experiences, right? Let's transition because there are a couple of questions coming in around testing. Priya, what do you think is the impact of test optional? Um, I think it is definitely opening up the, um, you know, the option for a lot more students to apply to colleges that they wouldn't have thought of applying to earlier, just because they think that they have, you know, the freedom to do so. Um, and which is not a bad thing because, you know, perhaps they do have other skills that they're bringing to the college application and they're sharing with that college. So, you, you know, being test optional for the college basically means that they have essentially a lot more um, applications to screen, you know, from that, from their end. But from the students end, I think it, you just have to make sure that you are giving the college some really nice meaty um, things to review if you are test optional. So your grades should be good enough, your activities, your essays, the non-cognitive factors. So there should be at least something that you're bringing to the application, which is kind of making up the fact that you're doing test optional in that aspect. Milan, why do you think it is that schools use testing um, and why, why do you think it is that they're missing testing as part of the admissions process right now? So, um, a lot of us here attended the UC Counselor Conference that just wrapped up. And one of the things they said, they, you know, they're, I'm sure, I think they're very happy with going test blind. But one thing that they did say is it took so much longer to read apps. And when we've attended other uh, uh, count conferences, um, admissions officers, they, they, some of them are like, oh my gosh, we couldn't wait to bring back test scores because they said we cannot add reading days to our calendar. And so that's that's one of the reasons, um, uh, even if they, some colleges experimented with test optional or test blind policies during the pandemic. And a lot of them, they've had that experience of having very, you know, not being able to um, just asking, it's too much to ask for their personnel. And so that's why some of them are just very happily reinstituting uh, the requirement of test scores because um, one of the things that families, I ask families to think about is it's not just your individual student's performance with the test course, but it's also a way to sort of vet the transcripts of everyone at a certain high school, right? So if you know, oh, you know, um, a, they're just handing out A's like candy, right? The test scores are a way to sort of vet that sort of information. And so it's in either getting a clear context about how that high school performs in addition to your individual performance. Yeah, um, and you know, just to give you a sense, average GPA in the US right now is a 3.6. That is an A minus B plus average. Average GPA is that high. So that's why it's really hard for colleges. It's exactly what you said, like, does this school just give out A's? Like, or, you know, is it a very rigorous academic school? Um, and test score really does give a bit more information around that. There are flaws with testing, no doubt. Um, and we could, you know, have conversations for hours around that, but it's just one piece of information in the admissions process that they're able to use to learn about a student. Um, and so I wanted to ask another question, kind of moving about moving on to applications. Uh, before I do that, there's one question, which is uh, what grade do students start do students start preparing for the SAT or ACT? Priya, when do you advise that they start doing that? 
You know, I think this depends family to family and student to student on the generally, I would say on the 10th or the 11th grade. Um, sometimes I think there's a student who's not that great with math. I encourage that family and that student to wait till after 11th grade is almost done so they can have the benefit of having that math and you know extra English under their belt. But there are some students who are brilliant, you know, even after 10th. And then, then that summer after 10th, between 11th and 10th, is a good time for them to take the test. So I definitely kind of make it based by, uh, you know, a student by student, not like a generic thing that, oh, you must take a test after 10th grade or after 11th grade. Um, I think it depends on the skills of the student, honestly. Yeah. Um, one thing is that both tests, SAT and ACT, include con math content up to Algebra 2 Trig. So we encourage kids to have finished the algebra two, two, algebra 2 portion of that class if they're doing a combined course before they do a diagnostic, because otherwise they'll take a test too early and it's going to really dissuade them because then they're going to feel like I'm not a good test taker. And probably it's just they needed to wait a few months to get through more math or potentially even a bit more English. And then their score would have gone up significantly. So you actually don't want to take tests too early. There's a psychological impact that can be hard to overcome. Um, so after that point is a really good time frame to, to start um, doing diagnostics and then based on diagnostics, which is just practice tests, that gives us a good a bit of information to then help think through a strategy. Um, another question that's come in is has the average GPA requirements gone up with test optional test blind situation? Priya, how would you answer that question? Has the average GPA um, requirements gone up? Well, I think the GPA requirements pretty much stay what they are. The What's happening now is just the fact that we don't have, well, all colleges don't have the SAT or the ACT since they're test optional or test blind. So the focus kind of falls more on the GPA as being the only you know, black and white tangible number. So if you were to kind of assume that the, um, the SAT, well, the standardized tests um, and the GPA were the two aspects that they were looking at previously, now they only have one. And since that's the only one, I think it kind of behooves us to kind of offer a, you know, a stronger GPA to the college. So obviously it becomes, you know, the center of attention for the lack of a better word, I guess. And how do, how do extracurriculars play into that? Um, I think offering extracurriculars that kind of match your interest. And, and that being said, going back to what you said earlier, Pubi, if you are undeclared and you don't know what you're doing, I think just enjoying yourself and kind of following up, you know, if you like robotics, if you like swimming, or if you like volleyball, whatever you like, just keep doing what you enjoy because your interest and passion comes through in the extracurriculars. And I think that's very important for the uh, admission counselors to see is that, yes, this kid has been engaged in what it, whatever they've enjoyed, you know, in the past three, four summers. Um, so it is important for you to keep doing something, whatever it is that you want to kind of do. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Um, we have just a few minutes. So I want to talk about applications, college applications. Um, we are in the thick of it. So this is really very top of mind for you guys. What do you guys see? And I'd, like, I'd love both of you guys to answer this. And Maylin, I'll let you go first. What's the most common mistake you see students making with their college essays? There's <laughs> so many of us like, oh, can't, I can't write about X, Y, Z. Like that's not important. So I think sometimes students, they, they underestimate what could make a great topic. So this is especially true uh, for the Common App, right? Because they're like, oh, but should this, should this be like a resume? And they, they forget, okay, there are other opportunities to talk about your accomplishments. The personal statement should be very personal. And for the, the UC application, the personal insight questions, um, the UC, they want, they want your responses to be personal. They put the word personal in the question, right? They really want to get to know you. Those uh, personal insight question responses, they form a context through which they will interpret everything else in the application. So I, I think that's one thing. Don't be afraid to really share yourself. Don't be afraid to share your stories because they, they really want to hear them. And they know that your transcript does not say everything. Yeah. Yeah. What would you say is the biggest mistake kids make? Um, just from a very practical perspective, what I want to share first is that definitely always read the prompt very well because the prompts can be tricky. I mean, each prompt can have so many hidden nuances. 
And what I tell my students is to take the prompt, highlight the three, four things that you see which are different in there. For example, describe um, everybody's creative, describe your, express your, how to express your creativity. Is it by problem solving? Is it by innovation? Is it by being artistic? Um, so those are, and then the thing, and or, notice the and or, are they asking for all three things or are they asking for one of the three things? So highlight the different aspects of the prompt first, then be very subjective. It's about you. So exactly like Melan said, in the UC application, for example, they have a list of activities that you fill out. You know, you played volleyball, you played the violin, you did whatever. And then on the other side, you have a list of eight prompts where you choose four. And then out of those four, you could choose to tell them a story about the volleyball, um, but it cannot be, but I scored this goal and I, and I was placed a national champ. It has to be, how did you feel when you were playing? Because we are offering, you know, we've been given the opportunity to offer different facets of you. So the essays are where we do the non-cognitive aspect. So I always tell all my students and, and Milan and uh, Purvi know this already, um, when we share your grades, it's sort of like a black and white sketch. When we add in your activities, we kind of giving it some hue. When we add the essays, we bring the painting alive. So we need those words from you to be your story, your personal stories. So please tell that story and share it with us. So we have so many different facets of you when we are uh, presenting your application in, you know, in a very big, huge, cohesive way, I guess. Yeah. Yeah, the only thing I'll add to that is it's the one word that you said, uh, Maylin, was the word resume, is that there is a, a tendency to stay on the surface because it's easier, right? It's easier to write on the surface and just talk about what you did rather than how did it feel? What did you learn from it? How was it hard? And, you know, so kids tend to, tend to write essays that are like, I did this and then I did this and then I did this and I did that. I'm like, okay, that's great. Like that was already in your activity section, as Priya was saying, I'm like, but I literally learned nothing new about you, or it just feels like you're bragging, right? Your essay is an opportunity to show how do you respond to different situations, which then tells a college, how will you respond to different situations when you're in that environment, the community, uh, university environment? So really don't be afraid to be vulnerable. Your voice is super important. Um, and what I do is I, you know, will have a kid read their essay out loud or I read it out loud and I'm thinking, can I hear the student's voice? Yes, I can hear the student's voice. It's a good essay. And that's really important. Um, this isn't what a mistake kids will make. This is a mistake parents will make is that they'll often try to get their hands on their kids essays. Having had experience of probably applying to graduate school and college and applying for jobs that you tend to want to make it prettier, um, more professional, but what you're doing actually is you're taking the voice out of it. And it's a huge red mark to college admissions officers, first of all, because now it's like, oh, okay, the student write the essay. And it's so, so easy to tell, so easy to tell. Um, and that immediately could mean the student's not gonna get in, but also your student's losing the opportunity to share something important to them, um, to him or her, like their 16 year old perspective, not you know a parent's potentially 40 year old perspective, which is very different. And so it's really important that it's authentic from the 16 year old. Um, and can I ask you guys about, oh, Jenny was just um, sharing uh, the slide again while I'm still talking. Um, Malin, what do you think is a parent's role in the admissions process? Obviously a very important role, but how would you define it? What would you say are the constraints? Um, definitely um, be, you know, be there to support um, what, uh, what your child is really prioritizing. And of course, you know your child very well. So you're a great resource that way. And, and honestly, it can be really di difficult even if you say, honey, just do whatever, right? Even, even then, even if you give your child complete agency, you might need to help them um, narrow things down and so on. So by figuring out what kind of support your child needs, um, that can be your role. And I would say, keeping a balance between making sure your child's needs are like, even if they're like, oh, but mom or dad, I'm not quite sure. Even if they're not sure, still giving them the space to express uh, what they really want to do or what they want to explore. While, um, you know, of course there's, you will always have your parenting instincts. There's that, that will always be there. 
but making sure they have sufficient space to really um, explore their needs and their goals. So par parents, basically, you're the you're the support team. You're the cheer you're the cheerleading squad. <laughs> yeah, Priya, how would you add to that? Um, I've sent two two of my own kids to college, and they've graduated. Thank the Lord for that. Um, and what, I know what I went through was um, I think listening to them very very important, making sure they don't stress out because every small thing triggers them at that stage. Um, making sure that when they're discussing things with you, you actually hear them and you're not just kind of giving, you know, your own spiel, which believe me, we want to do, but sometimes just listening and hearing kind of really helps them. They're just venting and you need to be the person that they can vent to safely, making sure they sleep enough um, because that time, those six months, the first semester of senior year is a very stressful time. So just making sure they eat well, they sleep well, Whenever there is too much stress, you hear them, you break down the problems with for them. Um, I would say definitely bring a whiteboard into the room, uh, prioritize the tasks for that day and then the week in different colors. Just, just kind of masterminding the whole plan for them and then letting them kind of uh, run with it. So, Yeah, I'll, I'll just add to this that <clears throat> this is a really stressful time in their lives and 16, 17 year olds often have a difficult time articulating that to their parents. And sometimes they don't even know that they're so stressed. They just feel it. And there's something that's like weighing on their shoulders. It's scary, right? They're going through an admissions process. It feels like someone is judging their life um, by going through this admissions process. It's also a, a big change in their life because they're getting ready to step out of their comfort of their home and into a new environment. Their friends are going to be going all over the country. So it's a lot happening for them. And so they just, again, sometimes have a hard time articulating that. Oftentimes why people come to us and to other counselors is because they want somebody else to manage the process. And also because things are changing on such a drastic, you know, daily basis, it feels like. that if somebody else is managing the process, at home, you just get to be the parent and you get to just talk to them and you get to be that comfort and support them without having to also ask, did you submit this form? Did you do this? Which is really hard for kids because then they're like, oh my God, like it's so task oriented. And so, um, you know, we cannot underestimate what they're going through for every child. Every child that might be super happy and excited and really gregarious at all times, they're also really having a hard time during the admissions process. So um, really important role that you guys play. And just kind of closing out, what would you say for, for younger parent, parents of younger kids, what advice would you give to them? Like for a parent of a ninth grader or eighth grader, what advice would you give there? And, and Priya, I'll start with you this time. Um, I think for parents of younger students, I would definitely tell them to kind of um, allow the students to try out different classes um, in summer, um, go for different uh, possibilities of activities, camps, that they could kind of assess what they want to do or kind of, or what they don't want to do sometimes. So when you say, I definitely don't want to be in this environment. That's a very, I actually like that more sometimes than sending a student to a place where I know they want to go because it's, it's by, you know, by process of elimination, you know, you don't want to be a lawyer, you don't want to be a doctor, et cetera. Um, so I think that's one very big thing. Two, I think just kind of cultivating um, strong study habits, um, discipline around when you want to study. So just, just having, you know, two, three hours in the evening when you know that's your study time, that just really kind of benefits him in the long run in school and then also in college. Um, keeping the health up again, making sure they, you know, they sleep well, they eat well, they exercise well, all those basic things which you want to kind of keep doing so that they don't kind of feel the crunch when it comes to the senior year for an application time. Yeah, great, thank you. Maylin, how about you? Yeah, so one one thing, or I guess maybe two things to keep in mind is I, I tell families, ultimately your child is going to attend one college. You have one body. You can only be in one place at one time. So that's to sort of diffuse what are the stakes involved. And the other is that if you are in eighth or ninth grade, so you know, think about, um, so when you think about it from a high school perspective, ninth grade is sort of designed, they're aware right, that you're kind of transitioning from one stage of your life to another. 
and kind of to echo what Priya was saying, getting really great habits like your self-care, sleeping, study habits, and so on. That's super important because from 10th grade onwards, then you're really in high school and you'll get the full high school experience, right? Because then you can choose, you, your high school might allow you to take an honors or AP class that you, they wouldn't allow you to take in ninth grade. And so you can, you can really, really use this time um, to create the structure that'll serve you for the rest of high school. Yeah. And just to close off, my advice to you would be, and this will feel antithetical to what we do, but is live your life as if college admissions is not a thing. And I know that, you know, for a lot of families, they start thinking about college, like their kids are in elementary school. Like, what do I need to do to get my kids into college? I'm like, you need to just like be their parent and teach them the right habits and the right values. And, you know, when, if you live your life as if college admissions is not a thing, you're actually better preparing them for the college admissions process because now they are not doing everything for the purpose of college admissions. They're doing things because it really matters to them. And probably as a family, you're spending more quality time together rather than shuffling from, you know, one activity to the other, to the other, to the other, for the sake of it, you're probably doing things that are more important to you. You're having more quality conversations with them. You may be spending less time doing travel activities and things like that. So remember your goal is not just to prepare your child for the admissions process, it's preparing them for life. And so if you, you know, treat parenting for that purpose, you're doing them such a long-term benefit that will have that benefit for the admissions process, but more so helping them prepare for after they, when they graduate from high school. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. Priya Malin, thank you so much for sharing your knowledge and your expertise. Um, Jenny has been putting in our information, contact information. If you wanted to join our mailing list, we send out really cool articles and videos on a regular basis. And we do a ton of community events that are free to attend. We will also be at the Diwali event in Cupertino in middle of October, October 16th. So you can come see us there. Um, and any of this um, information, if you'd like to get in touch with us, that information is here in the chat. Shafali, I think I'll hand it back to you. Thank you. Well, thank you so much. That was extremely uh, wonderful presentation. I personally already signed up. <laughs> I have a junior, so I really need the same kind of help that you were presenting. And uh, thanks a lot for joining us today. And uh, thanks a lot to Rishi and uh, the whole campaign for organizing this wonderful webinar for us. So thanks so much. And we will be in touch. <laughs> Great. Thank you so much. Thank, thank you, everybody. Bye -bye. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. Thank you, everyone.